So we're going to be reading this morning from Matthew chapter 6. If you want to open your Bibles, Matthew is a book of the Bible. It's about two-thirds of the way through, or you can open up your apps and find it there. But Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So we're partly through a sermon series called The Conspiracy of God, and the idea is that we are in the middle of God's conspiracy to overthrow evil in the world. And he is inviting us to participate in this conspiracy with him as rescued agents of his love and freedom. And in a section of the Bible, in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, it's often called the Sermon on the Mount, we hear Jesus inviting us to be a part of this conspiracy. He's describing for us what it's like to live in the kingdom of God, to live as people who celebrate Jesus as the true king. And so if you think back to the beginning of this sermon, we, Jesus started by redefining what the blessed life is like, what the good life is like. And we heard him say things like, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. And then he moved on to telling us that when we live life in the kingdom, we will stand out like salt and like light. And then he started to go through these behaviors that we have. We would all call them bad behaviors or sins, things like murder and adultery and breaking promises. And in each case, as he did this, he went for the heart that enabled those behaviors. Now we're at a point in the sermon where Jesus is going to shift from talking about our bad behaviors to talking about our good behaviors. And just like he did with our immoral behavior, when he talks about our moral behavior, he's going to go for our heart. So we're just going to listen to what he has to say today, going through this line by line. Starting in verse 1, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Be careful. Jesus is warning us here. And after all of the things he's talked about, like murder and lust and adultery, you would think that we'd be hearing a warning about something along the same lines, right? So it's a bit surprising then to hear him say, be careful about practicing righteousness. And some translations use the phrase good works. So why? Why the warning? Aren't good works good? Here at St. Paul's, we're encouraging each other to practice habits that are foundational to a life of discipleship, to practice righteousness. So why the warning? What could go wrong? Let's be clear first on what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying, don't do good works, as if the sentence ends after, be careful not to practice your righteousness, period. Not at all. These are good things to do. And after this statement in verse 1 about practicing righteousness in general, Jesus is going to move on to illustrate this with three specific practices. Giving, we're looking at that one today, praying, and fasting. He's not giving us a comprehensive list here of every good practice that will be part of our lives, but he's using these as examples so that we can understand the principle and, it apl and apply it to these practices and others. Things like reading our Bible or worshiping or participating in small groups. But here's the point. As we go through these different practices, we will notice that Jesus just assumes that we are doing them. So, for example, in today's passage, he just assumes that we are giving to the needy. And the second thing is, Jesus is not telling us that we have to go out of our way to hide our practices or good works, as if now the sentence ends at, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, period. 
That would contradict what he said back in Matthew 5, 13 to 16, where he described us as salt and light. And listen to Jesus there. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So our good works will be visible. The question is, who gets the glory? So Jesus is not saying, it's a new day, forget about all those good works, you don't even have to do those anymore. And he's not asking us to twist ourselves into knots to make sure that no one ever sees them. His full warning is this, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. The question for Jesus is why are we doing these? Who's our audience and what's our motive? When we practice righteousness, what are we seeking? If we are wanting to be seen by others, if we're seeking others' attention, then Jesus warns us it's a trap. And he puts it this way. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So that raises a couple of questions for me. First of all, why would God hold back a reward just because my motive isn't right? Isn't that a little bit like a parent saying to a child, if you don't eat your broccoli with the right attitude, no dessert for you. If the kid gets the broccoli down with or without a smile, shouldn't they get dessert? So why does my motive matter so much here? And the second question I have is, what's the reward? These two questions are so connected that I think they may have the same answer. And to get us started, I'd like to suggest this. The reward is what we are seeking. I think that's going to become clear as we unpack what Jesus has to say about giving. So first, he talks about giving in the wrong way, and then he's going to talk about giving in the right way. Verse 2, so when you give to the needy. Giving to the needy has sometimes been translated as giving alms. This would definitely include giving money, but it might also include taking a meal to someone or helping them out in a practical way. And this was a really big deal in Jesus' day. Historians tell us that when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and took the Israelites into captivity in Babylon, then they couldn't sacrifice animals at the altar in Jerusalem any longer. So the major way that they practiced righteousness, that they stayed in right relationship with God, was taken away from them. But what they could do was obey God's repeated commands to care for the poor. So giving to the needy became a primary way that they practiced righteousness, that they stayed in right relationship with God. All that to say, Jesus is starting with a big one here. He's starting with something that everyone knew was a good and right thing to do. And he goes on, do not announce it with trumpets. Now, Jewish scholar Amy Jill Levine reminds us that we probably shouldn't take this picture too literally. It's unlikely that people were arranging for little bands to precede them as they were giving to the needy. But pastor and author John Mark Comer points to a line of scholarship that thinks that Jesus might be playing with words here. You see, in the temple, there were chests that were shaped like trumpets. They were called shofar chests, and that's where people would drop their coins when they gave to God. So you can imagine someone coming along and giving one coin, a little clink would be heard. But then maybe someone could come along and drop a whole fistful, maybe throw it in to the chest, or even empty out a whole purse full of coins. You can imagine the racket that they would make as they would ricochet all the way to the bottom. The noise of the trumpet chest announced to everyone that day who was being extra generous, extra good. Jesus is painting a picture of people who are drawing attention to what they're doing. And he goes on describing this as what the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. So Andrew reminded me that in Jesus' world, hypocrites was the Greek word for a masked actor in a theater. And Jesus and his listeners would have known about the theater in Sephoris. In fact, some people think that Jesus and his dad, Joseph, who were construction workers, actually helped to build that theater. So the language of actors and actresses 
of hypocrites was familiar to Jesus' audience. Everyone knew that a hypocrite was someone who was play-acting for the applause of the crowd, someone who was wearing a mask to hide their true identity. And Jesus' use of the word hypocrite caught on, and today we use it readily to describe someone who's insincere or fake, someone who is living a performative life. And for giving done this way, Jesus observes they've received their reward in full. So if the reward is what we're looking for, then what are the hypocrites, the actors, looking for? Jesus gives us two things. First, they're looking for attention. He says they're seeking to be noticed by others. And then second, at a deeper level, they're looking for affirmation. Jesus uses the phrase, to be honored by others. And he doesn't rail against them. He just says, they've got all the reward they're going to get out of this. That's it. And then he compares it to what giving in the kingdom of God looks like. Verse 3. But when you give to the needy, once again, when, not if, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret. So that's a bit puzzling. How can I possibly give without half of myself knowing what I'm doing? Well, there are situations in life where our left hand is working independently and unconsciously from our right hand. For example, driving. So when we first start out driving, you know, all of our attention is given to where our hands are at 10 and 2 on the steering wheel, we're gripping them. But then, as we become more comfortable with it, we can be driving with our left hand and holding a cup of coffee in our right or playing with the volume, right? It's really natural for us. The act of driving is no longer a big deal. And so we don't tend to remember or look for approval for great moments of driving. Can you imagine, you know, remember how I came to that full stop in Eudora this morning? Or did you see how I signaled in Sunderland there? Of course not, we don't do that. And this sort of unselfconscious behavior is what caring for the poor should be like for us, Jesus is saying. It's no big deal, because it's just part of our natural life. It's not something we really call attention to or even notice ourselves. In that respect, it's done in secret. Dallas Willard puts it this way, the kind of people who have been so transformed by their daily walk with God that good deeds naturally flow from their character are precisely the kind of people whose left hand would not notice what their right hand is doing. What they do, they do naturally often automatically, simply because of what they are. They are absorbed in love of God and of those around them. They hardly notice their own deed and rarely remember it. And so then Jesus ends with, and then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. There's a reward again. So if we're working with the idea that the reward is what we are seeking, how does it apply here? And why don't I get the reward if my motive isn't right? I was thinking when Brad and I were engaged, I discovered that I love to surprise him with unexpected gifts. The latest hip album, a new novel by David Adams Richards, something with a sport for a sports team that he liked, and he kept things simple for me by loving all things Boston, so Red Sox, Patriots, and Bruins. <laughs> but what was I looking for in giving him these gifts? Well, it wasn't his love. I had a ring on my finger that said that I had that. What I was looking for was his joy, his delight, and a deepening of our mutual love. That was my reward. But can you imagine if I'd given these gifts instead with an eye to impressing our friends. So maybe I'd, at a party, I'd make sure everyone was watching when I'd pull out a gift for him. Maybe they could catch it on camera or something like that. In this scenario, what would I be looking for? Well, I'd be looking for the attention of our friends. I'd be hoping that they'd all be impressed with my thoughtfulness and general awesomeness. And you can imagine how that would play out. Brad would not have been impressed. 
So just by changing my focus in giving, I actually would make it impossible to receive the reward that I really wanted, his delight. I'd miss out on the true reward of my heart because I set my sights on improving my status with others instead of expressing my love for Brad. And I think this is what Jesus is talking about here. When we give to be seen by others, we're setting our sights too low. We're looking for a cheap substitute for what we really long for. See, the desire to be seen for attention, the desire to be noticed, isn't a bad thing in and of itself. Scholar Dale Bruner points out that we are made to want notice. Quote, the drive to be noticed is part of the image of God. We were made to notice and to be noticed by God. And kids express this regularly. Watch me, Dad, is a favorite line of a well-loved child. And this becomes an unspoken cry, notice me, in the heart of a growing person, of an adult. But as adults, we tend to look to other people to respond to this deep longing that we have. We perform for them. And that can include doing really good things just to get their attention. And this desire for attention is connected to some even deeper interrelated desires. I'm borrowing some language from New York pastor John Tyson here. Deep down, at our heart's core, we long for acceptance, for affection, and for affirmation, three A's. So when we do good things like giving to the poor, to be seen by others, to be noticed by others, I think that one of these three desires, at least one, is in play. Here's how it might work. The desire for acceptance, for belonging. If I donate to this cause, maybe those people will include me in their group. I'll belong. The desire for affection or for love. If I share my good deed on Instagram or Facebook, maybe I'll get a lot of likes. The dopamine rush of digital affection. And the desire for affirmation or a sense of value. If I casually share that I volunteer for this important cause, then maybe those people will admire my upstanding moral character. I'll have their approval. But here's the glaring problem with this strategy. No finite human can possibly meet our needs. We're all broken and longing to be filled. Another person, someone who, just like me, is an image bearer carrying around their own deep needs, they just cannot give me the unwavering acceptance, the unshakable affection, the deep affirmation that I'm longing for. You, me, we are made in the image of God. And that means that only He can satisfy our heart's deep longings. Psalm 37.4 captures this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Jesus knows this. Notice, he doesn't say here, you shouldn't want attention. You shouldn't desire acceptance or affection or affirmation. He's warning us not to look for satisfaction in places where it just can't be found. He wants us to redirect our hearts to God, who can meet our deep needs. Our need for attention, to be noticed, to be seen by others. Well, Jesus tells us here in these verses that God, our Father, sees what is done in secret. He sees. He notices you. When you look to him, you'll find that you have his undivided attention. Our longing for acceptance, Jesus talks about God as our Father. That's a relationship word. That's a belonging word. You are a child of God. You, me, each one of us, we belong to him and to one, another's as bro- one another as brothers and sisters. We're fully accepted. Our desire for affection. As he was on his way to the cross out of love for us, Jesus said this, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. The Father who sees, 
The father to whom we belong is also the father who loves us beyond anything we could imagine. And our desire for affirmation. What Jesus expressed in the verses we're looking at today is the desire to be honored by others. This may be the desire that we most struggle to believe is met by God. Psychologist David Benner, who's counseled thousands of people, remarked that when he asks people what they imagine God thinks or feels about them, the overwhelming response is disappointment. It's hard for us to believe that God approves of us, but that's the message that he has for us. For example, Isaiah 43 describes God saying to his people, you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Our need for deep affirmation is met by his delight in us. Last week, Andrew reminded us of the words that the Father said over Jesus at his baptism that are also true for us. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Hear how that blessing maps onto our needs. You are his son. You are his daughter. There's acceptance. You are loved. There's affection. He is well pleased. There's affirmation. So our reward then is at least this the full and overflowing meeting of our deepest heart's desires. This isn't about earning. There is nothing we can do to gain or earn or lose the Father's love. It's ours. But this is about redirecting where we look to meet our needs, allowing God our Father to meet our heart's longing with his love. And it's from this settled place of love where our good works can naturally flow. When we know that we are accepted by our Father, when we rest in his tender affection for us, when we are settled in his affirmation of us as his children, then our good works become a natural expression of our relationship with him. We practice them because we know they delight the one who loves us best. And we understand that his approval, his well done, is what matters most. Now, as we close, you might be aware of some places where your motives for giving or doing good deeds or practicing righteousness just aren't always all about the Father. And that's normal, that's typical. Richard Foster reminds us that we're all a mixture of motives and says that, frankly, this side of eternity, we will never unravel the good from the bad the pure from the impure. So what do we do? Just suppress our misdirected desire for attention, pretend it's not there? Stop giving until we get our motives all straightened out? Only serve when we are 100% sure that it's all about Jesus? I think we just need to hear Jesus here, to hear his warning. Be careful. We can't will ourselves into having the right motive for giving or practicing righteousness. Only God can change our hearts. But we can pay attention to those moments when we become aware that we're looking to be noticed by others. In my life, I can tell that this is going on when I feel disappointment or resentment or even self-pity because someone didn't notice that I was giving or serving in some way. Or when I find myself doing or thinking I need to do something because otherwise, what would people think? Those are in my life. You'll have your own warning signs, and I hope you can talk about them with your small groups. But when we notice these misdirected desires, we name them and we take them to Jesus. We ask him to help us know more of the Father's love as we continue to give and to practice righteousness. And as we open our secret hearts to him, his love will reorient our lives around him so that his opinion of us is what shapes our lives. So, some questions for us as we close. When you give or do good works, whose attention might you be tempted to look for? When that happens, which of those deeper desires 
accept, acceptance, affection, or affirmation is most likely to be in play? And how can you take your motives and needs to the Father so that he can meet them? Let's pray. I'm going to use the words from the Apostle Paul to pray. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in, in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant us to be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner beings, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Why don't you stand and I'll say a blessing over you as we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.